back to the Riri show. This is a super exciting um, episode because we have someone very special on the show. This woman has accomplished so much um, and made absolute leaps and bounds in this space. Her resume is nothing short of incredibly impressive. Um, I mean, she's podcast host of Coin Stories, investigative journalist, um, Emmy winning at that, uh, educator, media commentator. So please welcome the um, infamous Natalie Brunel. Oh my gosh. You are too kind to me. Thank you so much. It's, it's so nice to chat with you. Absolutely. I'm so excited um, to get chatting with you. I mean, you've done some really, really impressive things. So um, yes, let's, let's get going. Did I miss anything? First of all, I know you're such a busy woman. Uh, no, I mean, my background is investigative journalism. Uh, like you mentioned, I was a broadcaster for a long time, which, you know, I'm trying to like pivot my skill set to communicate messages and simplify the message of Bitcoin to audiences and use my television, you know, skills for that. So I'm excited to be to be working in this industry. It's awesome. Well, it's translating um, well. And I think that's one of my favorite things about watching you is like, it, it's a lot easier to understand. I mean, I know sometimes you you get really into it, but um, but it's awesome. And I think adoption is such a big deal, right? Like that's really what it's all about. So um, the education piece is really, really big. Um, so what was the pivotal moment that you really decided cryptocurrency and namely Bitcoin was something that that you believed in or what led you to pour your heart and soul into, into this in particular? Yeah. So I guess first I want to start with when I wasn't so sure I was, I was like so many people I relate to the average person in America who I speak to on my television um, appearances, who's just like, what is this thing? Should I trust it? I'm worried, you know, it's digital, it's new. Uh, I was like that at one point too. I heard about Bitcoin for the first time in 2017. I was living in Northern California and I knew some folks in Silicon Valley who basically started talking about Bitcoin and the different exchanges. And I just got curious. And I was curious enough to buy, although at the time I saw it as a huge risk. I was like, I'm probably going to lose all this money. I don't want to invest too much. Um, and I, I didn't know at the time that I really needed to do the homework and understand this as a technology network and understand the problem it was trying to fix with our money system. Because what I think is sad is that most of us kind of have this feeling or understanding in the back of our minds that something's broken, right? Something's you know, it's, it's sparking injustice and inequality and this wealth gap that keeps getting worse and worse here in the United States. But like, what is the problem? And for me as a reporter, I spent more than 10 years really seeing the problems in our society get bigger and bigger and balloon, even though, as you could probably imagine, the politicians would come in and say, oh, let me spend some more money or, oh, let me just blame this guy. But the problems would just get worse for the average person, including my family, who's first generation immigrant. So I was like, why is the system so broken? You know, it's the U.S. It's supposed to be the greatest country in the world. And one of my mentors at one point gave me the book, The Bitcoin Standard. And once I read that, it was really a pivotal moment for me because I realized just how much I didn't know before about our monetary system, how money printing works, like the history of money and the Fed. And that was like, I got so hungry for knowledge and information. I went down the rabbit hole as deep as I could. And that ultimately led me to start my podcast, Coin Stories, and start interviewing these folks that are so brilliant and knowledgeable who have been advocating for Bitcoin for many years. Um, so for me, I had to realize and understand the problem before I could understand Bitcoin as being the solution. And now I want to spread that message and help other people go on their journey. Right. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head there is like, you know, you hear about it and you think right away, I just need to understand the technology or what it is without understanding like why it is. And that's such a big part of it as well. Um, but speaking of, um, of politics, I, I just have to mention this. I just saw a picture of you on Twitter with the president of El Salvador. So <laughs> what was this about? Like, what was the conversation there? That was really exciting. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm so grateful that I had a chance to meet him. I've, he's been on the top of my list in terms of trying to get him for my, my podcast, but as, as you can probably imagine, you know, it's very hard to schedule an interview with the president of a sovereign nation. So, you know, I had the opportunity to basically introduce myself in person. So I flew down to El Salvador and I met him one-on-one -on -one and just, we just chatted about Bitcoin and, and both of our backgrounds. And the goal was just to, to get him on the podcast. Um, and he's not been agreeing interviews for the most part. He's basically said no to places like 60 Minutes and some documentaries that came down to film in El Salvador. But he did say in that meeting he would talk to me for Coin Stories. So I really look forward to being able to 
to really hear his background and his story, because if you follow my podcast, you know, it's a lot about Bitcoin and sort of the headlines and, and the technology, but it's also really about the human being being interviewed. It's like, where are you from? You know, what did your parents do? What did you want to be when you grew up? Cause I love those stories. I love origin stories. I love, you know, how, how someone ascended to success or what obstacles they overcame. I just, I love origin stories and biographies and autobiographies. So hopefully I'll get a little bit more to share with all of you on President Bukele soon. Yes, I'm so excited. Well, good for you. And you know what? I love those origin stories too, because I think that's one thing is you you kind of sit here when you when you enter into the space and you see all these people who are already accomplished and you know they've already done so much. And and as you kind of feel like, you know, how am I ever going to get there? Like yeah. maybe they started with something incredible, but hearing how mm-hmm. they got there really makes you feel like, okay, you know, I'm I can do this. And maybe I'm just, you know, I'm starting. This is my journey. So um that's really exciting. So what do you value outside of Bitcoin and crypto? cryptocurrency like in your life? What do you like to do? Oh gosh. Um, you know, it's so funny because right now I feel like my whole life is Bitcoin and I work seven days a week. Um, which is funny because before this, I was a broadcaster and I thought my lifestyle and job was crazy because, you know, news can break anytime. It was a very 24 seven job and I would have my phone sitting, you know, next to me and it would ring in the middle of the night and I would have to go cover some, some crazy story. So I thought things were hectic then, but Bitcoin's 24 seven too. So I try to, you know, when I can, I try to take some down time. And what I really love to do is I love to cook. Um, I'm a big, I I grew up with a mom who made home dinners. And uh, so a a lot of Polish and Italian influence in my cooking. I love to travel. Traveling has been actually probably the greatest privilege with this new career shift that I've had in Bitcoin, because before you know, I used to travel to like small towns where there was some terrible event that happened or a tragedy. And it was always very sad and it was difficult. And I didn't know how long I would be gone. Um, and, and now I'm traveling to places like El Salvador or these amazing conferences in cities that I've never been to. So I'm, I feel really privileged and blessed and, and I'm very, very grateful because for 10 years I did not live (laughs) a life of travel like that. And, uh, what else do I like to do? I love to go to the beach. I live near the beach, so I love to enjoy the sun and, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, and I read a lot. I read a lot about Bitcoin. <laughs> yes, of course. I'm sure reading is, yeah, it takes up a good bulk of your time also. Yeah. Um, but that's funny. I'm actually, I'm partly Italian, mostly Italian. So oh. we eat a lot of Italian cuisine too. Um, but yeah, I, I love food also. I love cooking too. When we have time though, like it seems like cryptocurrency, the, the thing about it is when you're in it, it's like it, the market never sleeps. So mm-hmm. you're just on 24 seven exactly. kind of through all of it. So who are your favorite Bitcoiners? Like for some Someone who you're for yourself, like, um, I mean, who inspires you or who do you watch? Where do you get your knowledge from? Yeah. So, I mean, there are so many people in this space who inspire me, which is why I really have enjoyed doing coin stories. Um, I would say at the top of my list would be people like Preston Pish and Jeff Booth and Michael Saylor. And I mean, there are so many, I, the list could go on Lynn Alden, I think is like the most brilliant mind that we have in this space. I mean, she's just, when I listen to her, I have to listen to the interview two or three times just to try to absorb how smart she is. And we're just so lucky. And we, we have people like Max and Stacy, who I got to spend time with in El Salvador, who have literally seen the light and seen the potential for Bitcoin since 2011, when it was a dollar, a coin, yeah, that's um, <laughs> you know, and Jack Mahler, Jack Dorsey. I mean, I am so amazed by the people in this space, which I truly believe that the smartest people that we have in the world are in Bitcoin. So just to be able to absorb some of their knowledge through their work or getting to talk to them has been amazing. Um, And I also, I can't not mention Seyfedina Moose because his book really changed my life. I mean, the Bitcoin standard, I read it a couple of times. I read the new book, the Fiat standard, which I highly recommend. And it was honestly that book that triggered this like spark in me to want to go down the rabbit hole and to also eventually leave my job. So without Seyfedina, like, I don't know if I'd be here. <laughs> that's huge. I mean, just the fact that you got to, um, kind of leave your job and come here full time, like that, that says enough right there. Right. Yeah. Um, so, um, I have kind of just a general question. Do you have any theories on who the infamous Satoshi Nakamoto is? I mean, I don't think in the history of finance, like we've ever seen somebody be able to like build mm-hmm. something this big and then just disappear off the face yeah. of the planet. You'd think we know this. by now? Yes. Well, I think it's actually, I mean, it's clearly, 
the work of a brilliant man or woman who, you know, had great operational security and knew how to hide their tracks. I don't give too much thought to who Satoshi Nakamoto is, but I'll say two things to answer your question. Number one, if, if you, you know, pinned me up against the wall and said, you have to guess right now who it is, I would have to say it's Hal Finney. And I, I think I want it to be Hal Finney because all of the things that I read about him are just so positive and he made just great contributions to the technology and the programming and proof of work. Um, but also he just, he seemed like a good guy. He seemed like someone who was passionate about Bitcoin and a family man. And there were these messages that he left on one of the, the online uh, chat boards about Bitcoin when he was basically signing off and he was sick and he said, I'm comfortable with the legacy that I leave behind. Like my kids know where my keys are or whatever. And I just thought, you know, it just seemed like a guy who there's something behind that word, like legacy, like maybe there's something more, maybe he helped create it. So I would say it's, it's how Finney, but the other thing I will say is I'm, I come from a religious background. Like I'm, I'm a woman of faith and I love that I've met so many Christians through Bitcoin who believe that God had a hand in this because we truly, I mean, I, I, I think about the world without Bitcoin and I didn't have a lot of hope for it before I really understood Bitcoin as the solution to all these problems. I had this feeling of, I don't know, maybe I became like a jaded reporter who just felt like all these problems just keep getting worse. They're going to keep getting worse. And, you know, I don't know how I'm going to afford life for a family someday. And Bitcoin came like swooping out of nowhere. This, you know, it was like a phoenix rising from the ashes. And I just think we needed it really at this point in time because things have gotten so dire and so, so, you know, just manipulated and people are just really struggling. So I don't know. I think, I think God had a hand in, in Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, yeah, no, definitely. I think, um, I think when Bitcoin came in, it really, like, I mean, I mean, it's been named like, um, the biggest transfer of wealth in the world. Right. So, um, I mean, it kind of gave a lot of hope to a lot of people and I think it still is. I mean, in my opinion, we're still quite early. I am going to ask you a little bit about that later. Um, but anyway, so let's get in, let's get into a little bit of the, the easier nitty gritty questions. So someone asked me um, a really interesting question the other day and I was like, I haven't really thought about you know, um, once Bitcoin is actually our full functioning form of currency and what that's going to look like, like quite often, you know, we're still on the lead up and we're working on our investment strategies, et cetera. Um, but they asked me simply like what in your imagination or, you know, once regulations and all this exist, like, how do you see Bitcoin working? If you were to say, go into a grocery store and you're buying a jar of pickles, like what denomination would you say you pay in? Like, do you pay in 0. 0.000 whatever <laughs> Bitcoin? Or is it something where we're still using the denomination of, of the dollar mm -hmm. um, and then that's being transferred out of your wallet? How do you see that? Yeah, I think that's, you know, a really interesting question because it causes you to really fast forward in your mind a couple of years because the process of monetization, it really does take a long time. You know, I think it took a thousand years for gold to become money and we're in such a baby stage of Bitcoin and yet it's grown to be so strong and resilient as a network and, and you know, resilient to nation state attacks. So I'm really inspired by just how quickly people are adopting Bitcoin. I, um, I think that there's going to be a juxtaposition depending on the nation. So, you know, I just came back from El Salvador where there are communities where it's already incorporated in the economy. People have things priced in Bitcoin and people convert back and forth and they use it as a medium of exchange and as a currency. But I still think that Bitcoin, especially in big nations like, um, like the U.S., with more stable currencies. I think that the process of monetization is going to go in sort of the, the order that Vijay Boyapati talks about in his book, The Bullish Case of Bitcoin, where it goes from sort of a collect a collectible item to a store of value, which is, I think, the place that we're at right now in our country, to a medium of exchange, to a unit of account where things are actually priced in Bitcoin. So I think we still have a ways to go because Right now, my job, I feel like my job and calling has been to help people understand in the US that this is a really powerful savings technology. You know, that right now they have to risk their money after they make it. They have to try to figure out stocks and try to become part time brokers or day traders or, you know, spend it on expensive real estate. 
Um, and there's really no place you can put your money without either great risk or it just melting like an ice cube in the bank account. And so for me, Bitcoin is just this really powerful wealth accumulation tool, especially for young people who have really you know, been disadvantaged by the system. And we have so much debt that our um, predecessors and policymakers have allowed this country to get into. So I see that it will be at least in the US like a savings account first or a savings technology then I think it could become a currency down the road. And if it were to become something that everyone uses because it's this neutral currency that anyone can use around the world, then I think maybe things could be priced in Bitcoin. And that would be cool, you know, to see something, go into a coffee shop and have pay for something in like a couple of sats or um, I don't know that people would want to price things in 0. 0.0000 whatever <laughs> Bitcoin. But I think that that is a very far away scenario. I really do. I don't think the unit of account would happen for at, l- at least a decade. Personally. Yeah, totally. I mean, we're still so far away. Um, but yeah, that would be really interesting. I, I had that thought the other day and I was like, that would be so odd to see, like, you know, yeah. it costs a certain amount of Bitcoin and, and, you know, and then you go travel and you're going somewhere else. And usually, you know, you have to think about the currency in that other, that other place. Mm-hmm. But if, you know, one day in the very distant future, this was global, yeah. it would be interesting to see how that works. Oh. Totally. Um, Yeah. So um, I think one of the biggest struggles with the general population is really understanding Bitcoin and, you know, how it can have value and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And we all have kind of, I think like if you've studied cryptocurrency, everyone kind of has a very similar elevator pitch (laughs) about the value, the gold standard, the fiat, et cetera. Um, But like for you, would you have anything to add to that? Or how do you, like, is there people in your life that are still having a hard time grasping it or understanding it? And how do you kind of start with those people? Yeah. I mean, I think the thing that I like to focus on right now, because it's so relevant to everything that's happening is just inflation and how much it crushes the average person. I think that it sounds nice in theory that the government could spend all this money and, you know, send checks or create these different programs or um, build up their agencies. It sounds nice in theory, but it's really not thought out with the long-term consequences and the long-term tab that we're putting on our children and our children's children. And so I just think that we need to claw some of that back. And the the sad thing about it is that we're so indebted as a nation now, and we've allowed ourselves to kick the can down the road so far that, you know, taking a little step back could be very painful. I mean, we're so leveraged right now. We have this huge debt to GDP issue because we've printed so much money that if you pop the bubble, it's, it's a very big pop, you know, you risk a very massive crash, but if we don't have that sort of, you know, reckoning in the system and a little bit of unwinding to rebuild, we're just going to keep going in the direction of more and more inflation. And that doesn't hurt the people that have a ton of money. They actually, you know, are, are lucky when something like that happens and they, they go from being an X amount of billionaire to even more having more billions. Like we saw with some of the big corporations during the pandemic, but it really hurts the average person. And what can you do? Right. The average person is just trying to work and support their family. And I just, I think of those people because that represents my family. And so that's where I normally start because I think all of us, we have this like universal desire to connect and to do the right thing. I really do believe that people are, are inherently good and they want to see their communities thrive and succeed. And so we need to create or have a a form of money that doesn't just get debased and doesn't get, you know, inflated through money printing. And that allows people to save so that they can spend in their communities and take care of their families and provide things like education and, and housing and all that. So I kind of start with just, you know, talking about inflation and how much it's hurting the average person and seeing Bitcoin as this alternative that no one can take from you and no one can debase and no one can print more of. And I think that's really powerful today. Definitely. And I think given that inflation currently is like an all time, all the time high. I mean, we're feeling it um, here in Canada. Um, gas prices are out of control. Food is getting more expensive. So yeah. I think that drive of people that are noticing that are starting to maybe come over to the other side a little bit. So, um, but I, okay. And then the, another thing that really messes with my mind is I often think, you know, I, I took my, my, my grandma the other day, I was calling her and trying to figure out her banking with her and, you know, crypto is wonderful, but it's not necessarily easy. I mean, you know, you have wallet seed phrases, uh, ledgers and treasures and transactions and exchanges. Um, Do you think this will change or get a lot easier? I mean, how do we expect like, you know, the elder community to be able to do these things? 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, I think sometimes we overcomplicate crypto a little bit because at the end of the day, we're all not transacting in cash anymore, right? I mean, some people do, especially on smaller purchases, but for the most part, we all have digital bank accounts and our government is, is when they say printing money, they're actually just, you know, they're debiting or um, adding dollars in an electronic format. So we've already sort of moved into the digital landscape. The thing I think that's hard for people people to grasp is this idea that, you know, you really have to be protective of custodying your Bitcoin because you can lose it. It's not a situation where you could just easily call someone and reverse something. You have to make maintain, you know, the privacy and security of your passphrase, your seed phrase um, and your wallets. And so I think that's where the challenge is. And there are definitely going to be people, especially older generations who don't want to take on that responsibility because it is a little bit intimidating and you don't want that fear of knowing that you could lose your life savings just by, by forgetting a password, which is the case. So I think that this will open up a lot of avenues and opportunity for companies that kind of go into that um custodial space. And certainly we have it. We have multi-sig wallets and companies that uh, help you kind of triangulate the security of your Bitcoin, which some, some of the maxis are against that, right? Because they want you to become a bank. But, you know, that's not going to be the way that you get mass adoption. I think that a lot of people are just going to want to have help and have someone hold their hand through that and help secure their Bitcoins, which is totally fine. You know, at the end of the day, the more options that are available, the better, as long as people have Bitcoin and have the opportunity to to save in it. So I think we're going to see, you know, a simplified message. The more that people have it, it's going to be simplified. And also there's going to be just more companies that offer different services in this area. But I I wouldn't be too discouraged because everyone's already using online banking. Totally. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing is it, it, I think when people don't necessarily like change, like human beings have a tough time with change. So I think when you relate it to that and relate it to the fact that we do online banking and, you know, progressively more and more, everything's done online. I mean, now you can literally halt your card online. You can change things. You can open up accounts. Um, but it just sounds, it sounds more complicated when it's a new concept. So, um, yeah, education there, like everything else, education is so important. Um, so, I mean, this is another really, really big thing. Um, and we experience this now. So, um, in terms of censorship, which is something we notice all the time online right now, um, if you've tried to Google, you know, anything outside of the norm or, or the mainstream media, it's really, really hard to find. So, um, I know you are passionate about people speaking their minds and kind of not playing into the narrative, which is something I really love about you. Um, and I disagree with, with censorship, um, et cetera, for all those reasons. So do you think as adoption then continues and more people are understanding, you know, the value, not just financially, but, um, the value in a decentralized way of life, that censorship is going to start increasing then on platforms like YouTube and Twitter, as people start researching. Yeah, I think we're in just a really pivotal moment when it comes to history whether you're talking about currency or technology. Um, and certainly it's just been so disheartening to see that governments, even democratic governments like Canada are willing to actually seize or freeze people's accounts as if they don't, you know, they don't own their own money that they earned and put in there. They're just renting it. You know, that is really scary. And, you know, my family first generation came from Eastern Europe and they suffered from communism, the oppression of communism. And so they do not want us to head in that direction. And unfortunately, I think because of our monetary policies, fiat, how politics is connected to, um, you know, financial spending in the financial sector, it's driven us to this place where we're headed toward a more authoritarian, more centrally governed, um, you know, form of government, which I think limits people's freedoms and people need to stand up and fight for them. So I was, you know, the stuff that we saw in Canada was just, it was just really sad um, because a government should never be able to just freeze your bank account. That is, that is just tragic and scary. It should wake up everybody's eyes to something like Bitcoin. Um, but then on the bright side, we're also seeing, you know, people are helping Ukrainian refugees in real time being able to flee and take their whole life savings with them in a way that can't be confiscated, in a way that can't be um, devalued by remittance fees and can't be, you know, stopped or halted in any way. So 
I think that there are so many use cases that are playing out in the geopolitical events that we're seeing around the world. But certainly, you know, freedom is really important to me. Um, I just believe that people need to have the freedom to especially be able to save and take care of their families financially. And governments should stop intervening so much because they only create more problems. I truly believe that many people go in, I think, with really good intentions, but we have to hold their feet to the fire because some of the politicians that we have, at least in this country, they've been in for decades and decades. They are in their 70s and on their watch, things have gotten harder for the average American. And yet it's so hard to get them out of office. So one, I, we, if we separate money from politics and money from government, I think we will have a solution to some of these issues. I'm, um, it's actually interesting to hear you talk about, um, the whole, the whole scenario in Canada with the truckers convoy, because, um, you know, yeah. when in your own country, you're not sure how far that gets out, but, um, it's really been worldwide. I mean, there's been a number of people that have talked to me about it. And the crazy thing was, is like a lot of these people weren't even at the protest at all. Like, Mm -hmm. and, and they maybe knew somebody or, or sent a family member some money and those people's bank accounts are frozen. Like it was way out of the circle of just the protesters. And I think that was definitely like an eye opener. And that was something that really, really shook me. And I was like, wow, like, you know, I already, I already figured. And like, you know, I already understand that cryptocurrency in my Mm -hmm. eyes is really valuable, but um, to, to see it actually happen in real life and see the mm-hmm. control they have. It's like a whole other thing to witness it firsthand. Right. Um, yeah. I'm, it's like terrible, but at the same time, it is really putting a spotlight on Bitcoin and how important it is to have this form of money that gives you an alternative from the traditional system. Because when push comes to shove in, in a crisis, basically you could be a prisoner to the decisions of a couple politicians who you've never met, right? And who you have no control over what they're going to say or do on any given day. And you need to be able to access your money. Like you have the right to the money that you earned. And the more that countries do what Canada has done or other places that are trying to freeze access to accounts, the more we're going to see people move to Bitcoin. Absolutely. It just puts, it just puts more, more pressure and more demand. Right. So, um, I, so let's just jump in then to, um, now that we're already talking about like politics and world events, et cetera. So something you are fantastic with, um, among many other things, but it's often difficult for people to understand the full picture. And I think, um, you know, um, with world events, they do have a direct effect on the market. Are you able to touch at all on how world events, uh, affect the market? I know that's a big topic, but if you have any pointers or anything you can share with us. Yeah, well, I mean, just like we were talking about just a few minutes ago, the geopolitical events that are happening are just putting this massive spotlight. I think they're a big commercial for why you need Bitcoin, because things can change very drastically. And we're seeing it play out with the Canadian truckers, like average citizens who are donating to a crowdfunding site. All of a sudden, their accounts are being seized or freezed or they're, they're um, you know, potentially liable for some sort of criminal activity out of nowhere or, you know, in Russia the sanctions have crippled the value of the ruble. So average citizens in Russia, who, by the way, may oppose the war and be completely against it. Now their savings went from being worth $100 to $25. I mean, 75% collapse in a day because of decisions they had no control over. They have no access to things like Visa or MasterCard because companies are, are saying they're going to you know halt their products there. Things can change in the matter of a couple of seconds and minutes, and you could need to flee with your money in, in a desperate moment like we're seeing in Ukraine in Ukraine. And there's literally no form of money outside of Bitcoin that can't be manipulated and is out of the control of any central authority, any government, any corporation. It is yours. You are sovereign and you can take it wherever you want. It is borderless, permissionless, central existent, and it settles in, you know, 10 minutes. I mean, I I don't think that there's ever been a time where this technology has been more needed and more necessary. And I'm really inspired by that. But it's so sad to witness all these events playing out that have to put a spotlight on these features of Bitcoin. So um, the one thing I, I will say I'm surprised about is that because of all this playing out, the price isn't, you know, back up in the 50s or 60s like we would obviously like to see. But I think it just puts a spotlight on just this crazy macroeconomic environment that we're in. We don't have a lot of liquidity. We don't have that that quantitative easing that the government has been doing for so many years, which has always helped Bitcoin. And we really need some sort of push, especially, I think, on the institutional side to just come in with some really big pockets that will move the price in a certain direction, because it's great that we have the the everyday person, the retail adopters coming in and noticing that they need something like Bitcoin, 
but really the market movers are going to be the bigger, the bigger companies. Like if a company like Apple came in or, you know, a Google or an Amazon, that would be, that would shift the price up. Um, so I think regulation will help with that because a lot of institutions don't have the proper avenues right now. There are too many questions with regards to what's a security and how will Bitcoin be regulated and what on-ramps and off-ramps are there? Um, you know, we don't have an ETF yet. So there's going to be a lot of movement and momentum in the next couple of years, but I, I certainly think it's a good time to buy now and anytime and, you know, dollar cost averaging, but this is not Bitcoin's high. So this, I'm excited because I'm, I'm dollar cost averaging and accumulating as much as I can right now, because I do think that once Bitcoin rallies and really takes off, the sky's the limit. We've heard lots of people talk about this kind of um, six figure Bitcoin stuff. And um, I mean, I have, I'm not, I'm personally not a Bitcoin maxi, but I do have Bitcoin. And I think in terms of inflation, you know, we're already seeing the effects of it um, tenfold. And I think, you know, given, given the whole scenario with, with Ukraine and Russia and what's going on in the, in the political force and um, with the war and et cetera, we've seen it increase um, like insane, but um, over this next like six to 12 months, or maybe a couple of years, do you see inflation really like going through the roof or like, you know, where we're paying like, you know, a hundred dollars for a meal or something like this? Do you see this success? of inflation happening and, and in our near future? I do sadly see inflation becoming a growing issue. Um, and I'll tell you why. I've had some really interesting conversations on my podcast with some folks that some of them are not even Bitcoiners. They've just been watching, you know, the macroeconomic environment for years and strategizing and analyzing it and putting out charts. Um, and several of them have kind of come to the same conclusion that we're in such a dire situation with debt right now that the bubble has to pop and we're sort of overdue for for it, but we've been, we've been able to kick the can down the road, but certainly that does not mean that the bubble's going to, uh, inflate forever. And at some point it will come crashing down. Now, what the fed and what our governments have shown us is that in the event of a crash, which essentially they caused because they blew up the bubble in the event of a crash, they're going to try to reinflate it. They're going to step in. And, you know, there are so many companies, corporations, banks that are too big to fail. They can't allow pension funds to go underwater. They can't allow, you know, they're going to start revving up the money printer again. So what I see happening, which is kind of a bit of a dire prediction. So this is just my personal opinion. I do think that we're eventually going to have a really big crash. I think we're going to have an unwind. There is so much leverage that needs to be washed out um, from the system. And at that point, I think that Bitcoin, I think everything's going to take a really big hit. I think that the more traditional investors, the folks that, you know, maybe the older generations, they're going to rush to something like gold because it's known around the world as a store of value in a, in the scenario of something like that. But I think after that is where really the crazy stuff happens because after that crash, they're going to have to initiate the money printer to a level that I don't think we've, we've ever seen. I mean, we've, we thought we've never seen it before. It's unprecedented. I think it's going to go tenfold. I think they're going to kick in just massive bailouts, massive amounts of liquidity to try to fix the, the problem and reinflate the balloon. And uh, at that point, I think is when Bitcoin goes into what we like to affectionately call hyper Bitcoinization, because at that point, I think people are going to be jumping off the ship, trying to find a life raft saying like, OK, at this point, like the Fed has lost all credibility. They are going to try to prop up this bubble, bubble but it's based on nothing. The dollar is losing its value. So we, I need to put it somewhere. And I think that's going to be really helpful for, for Bitcoin. Um, but I, yeah, I do see at that point when they rev up the money printer, inflation could go to 15%. It could go to double digits. Uh, and I don't think we're safe from that. So I, I actually don't know how the Fed avoids that scenario. And again, it's kind of dire. It's my, it's my prediction based on all my interviews I've done. But I don't see how the Fed walks back all the, all the things they've done for so many years now. There's, you know, it, it's impossible. Like, I just, I feel that way too. Um, and I always think it's so funny because people have this kind of, well, not, not people in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency necessarily, but the general population kind of always has this idea that, you know, um, you know, we go through these rough patches and it's fixed, but at that moment, and like with that big of a crash or an economic collapse, like, I don't see how they would be able to, to backpedal either. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, it's sad. It's sad. It's unfortunate. But like you said, I think like, you know, it, it's darkest before the dawn. And, and if nothing happens, we can't see change. So, um, I mean, that that's one thing that makes me feel really good is hopefully this is the start of something better, you know? I completely agree. And I think that's why my work, 
I really take my work so seriously and I'm so passionate because the more I see Bitcoin as Noah's Ark, like the flood is coming. We can't stop the flood. It's going to come and the writing is on the wall, but we can help usher people onto this beautiful arc and this system that is completely separate, that is completely independent and allows us to rebuild and create a new financial order that's more inclusive and, and more just based on like factors that are, are fair. I think, you know, it doesn't disproportionately allocate money to certain people and make the rich richer. It helps the average person who wants to contribute to the economy or to society. And so I'm really hopeful. I have, I have a lot of hope, but we need to get the word out to as many people as, as possible. So, well, you're doing a really good job of that. So <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So, I mean, the market, the last little while has been, it's been a little bit of a struggle, um, but it's been exciting. Nonetheless, it's a ride like it always is. Um, but what do you say to people that, you know, ride so much on every price fluctuation? Because when you zoom way out of the chart and you look at Bitcoin, even like, you know, say two years ago, we were only in four digits still. Um, so if you look at just a, a you know, a two year span, even with the market being where it is, um, I mean, we've come leaps and bounds to where we were before. Um, so does the term, you know, we are still early that holds value to you still? No. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's really important for everyone to zoom out. And that certainly also means for Bitcoiners, because it's so hard not to watch the price and try to analyze everything. And, you know, we have people who are trying to figure out when that next big rally is going to come. And that's all fantastic. But we have to zoom out and look at the pr price performance over the last 13 years. I mean, Bitcoin has outperformed everything. It's outperformed the S&P. It's outperformed gold. It's outperformed every single stock that you could have purchased. And it's really allowed people to create generational wealth. I mean, I wish that I knew about Bitcoin many years ago. You know, I wish that I had done my homework. And it, there's that saying that you get Bitcoin at the price you deserve, right? So um, I think that it's important to look at this as a very long-term strategy. And no one, I believe it still holds true that no one who put in money into Bitcoin and held it for four years or longer has lost money. You might lose in the short run. You know, you might be down for six months or a year, but you don't lose money in the long run. It's such an incredible piece of technology that's still so early. And, um, and I hope that no one looks at it right now as too expensive because, you know, we need to also help people understand that you could buy fractions of a Bitcoin. And while your savings account at like Chase or Wells Fargo is earning 0 0.0 whatever percent interest rate, Bitcoin is on average gaining like a hundred percent a year. So it's like, we really need to help people understand that. Mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of, of politics and heavy world events, we generally see, um, you know, this big push upwards in the charts. And I, and I know there has been a little bit, and especially over the past couple of days, we've seen some green, um, and there's been stints. Um, but do you see like a, like a six digit Bitcoin, maybe in the short term future? Is this something you're predicting for long-term out? I don't know if we'll see a six figure Bitcoin this year. I've been like teetering back and forth on how bullish I am about that. Of course, I would like to see it, but I think it depends on whether more liquidity is injected into the market. And I just, I really do think that the Fed has to show that they're serious about inflation by doing these rate hikes. And I think they're, they're trying to be very careful, right? Um, I, I interviewed Dylan LeClaire and he made a great analogy. He said, they're trying to turn down the dial. Like it's a dimmer, you know, and they're worried that like, if they go too far, it's going to be a switch. It just like collapses the whole thing. So they have to be very careful. So they're doing these like baby rate hikes of 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Um, but it, you know, we are, we just, we're, we're too far in debt to be able to service that debt by increasing interest rates to the level that will actually fight inflation. So it just goes back to that idea that they're between a rock and a hard place. I think investors are, are nervous in general. And so I just see choppy waters ahead. I see a lot of volatility. I would not be surprised if Bitcoin stayed in just a very disappointing range for the next year that, you know, we should all look at as an opportunity because the thing is, is, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword, right? It's like, I want Bitcoin to get to six figures. That'll be so exciting. That'll bring even more attention and more, you know, investors in, but at the same time, then it's so much more expensive to buy it. So we're still dollar cost averaging and accumulating. So the more that the price is suppressed, the more we can get for, for each paycheck allocation. And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if we'll see a six figure Bitcoin, but I think I'm trying to look at the bright side of that. So maybe, so maybe it'll happen. Who knows? <laughs>
Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's, um, so important to note is exactly that is, you know, it plays this mind game with you. So quite often, you know, it's the whole theory of FOMO. As soon as it starts mm-hmm. to go up, you <laughs> want to buy more. Cause you're like, Shit, I missed it. Like I missed oh. the moment, but it's really important that, you know, it, it's an opportunity when the market is down ultimately. And all in my opinion, of course, but I mean, you, you don't want to buy high and sell low or sell it all. Exactly. Really. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to be buying in these dips, but it, it is a mind game because you see it go down. And I mean, there's nothing more stressful than seeing red in the charts. Oh, I know. And I'm like one of those people who I swear every time I buy, especially if I buy like a bigger chunk, the market immediately goes down afterwards. And I'm like, gosh, darn it. If I just would have waited. And then, it, you know, the flip side happens as well. I'm like, maybe I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. And then the market shoots up and I'm buying at a more expensive price. So, you know, but that just goes to show don't time the market. It's time in the market. Don't time the market because none of us can, you know, predict the future or predict the whims of what happens in Bitcoin day to day. I think there's too many, you know, world events, life events, politics, things that affect the market that it's really hard to pre- like, you know, really nail it on the head every time or really predict when all of those, you know, highest highs or lows are. So um, yeah. I'm more of a believer in, in, you know, cryptocurrency in general and the technology behind it. Are you able to share with us? Like, what is your strategy? Do you dollar cost average then most of the time or? I dollar cost average. And then I also try to kind of save some powder for dips where I can allocate a little bit more. Um, But I am just, I'm really heavy on Bitcoin. I really believe in it. I don't have other altcoins or cryptocurrencies. I'm, I'm like many Bitcoiners where I kind of started with that strategy and I realized that it's sort of a a losing game in the long run, because again, it requires you to time the market. Like when do I sell these? And some of they could, some of them, honestly, they've gone to zero or they don't exist anymore. Or they have issues. And Bitcoin I have, I have found is just that long-term safe bet where I can set it and forget it. I don't have to think about it or strategize or worry if a certain company is going to do something or whether, um, you know, one of the other currencies is just backed by some VC who wants to get rich and get out. So for me, Bitcoin has just been like a really safe bet. And I am just really excited about where it is in five, 10 years. Like I would love to have a crystal ball and just see it because I think that we're going to see mass adoption in the next five years. I think we're going to get to a billion users. I think, um, I just think it's going to rapidly start to catch fire. And at that point, you know, I'm going to be like, shoot, I wish I bought more. (laughs) Oh yeah. Well, I mean, we're going to FOMO for eternity, no matter what. I don't think that's like avoidable. (laughs) Um, But anyway, Natalie, you, you are a busy lady and we are, we are out of time together, but I really, really enjoyed um, chatting with you and I can't wait to share this. Thank you so much. It's been so nice to talk to you. You ask such great questions. You are beautiful. You look like a ballroom dancer from Italy. So um, just, yeah, it's a pleasure to chat with you and thanks for wanting to have me on. Right back at you, gorgeous girl. Sounds good. Well, enjoy your time and we'll see you later.